There are many things that the normal human mind fears every day it endures this existence. Things as simple as finances being in order, scaling all the way up to wars and atrocities that our own very human nature lends us to. But there is one fear that topples them all, the fear of the unknown. To look in the infinite darkness of the ether and to wonder what horrors lie beyond the walls of sleep or the veils of reality that we find ourselves looking through. We've all felt the tug of it once. A burning question in the deepest recesses of our minds. What horrors await us beyond this small pebble? And sometimes, when we stop to consider how little we know about our own world, we find ourselves wondering something even darker. What horrors lie below, or right next to us? H.P. Lovecraft, a household horror name that's as regarded as Edgar Allan Poe. A Rhode Island resident who spent his entire life in Providence and is regarded as the grandfather of what we now call the genre of cosmic horror. For those who don't know the name, you may recognize some of the works. Stories like The Call of Cthulhu, The Dunwich Horror, or The Shadow Over Innsmouth are considered the classics of his bibliography and are so well regarded that they've affected the rest of fiction with their themes and narrative devices. His influence is so great that it extends to film, comic books, video games. Essentially, if there is any form of media that can be used to tell a fictional story, then Mr. Lovecraft's influence can be seen in it in even the tiniest slivers, like a constant nihilistic reminder of just how small we are. But for those who don't let such a crushing existential weight hold them down and just appreciate good horror, Mr. Lovecraft's bibliography can provide many a scare and shock, none the least of which are his stories part of the well-named and iconic Cthulhu mythos. For films, one might find themselves straying into the territory of a man named Stuart Gordon, who's made a name for himself making horror movies and inspired by the works of H.P. Lovecraft since the 1980s, and I won't even begin to list off the Lovecraftian inspired abominations of the Marvel or DC canon, otherwise we'll be here all day. But whether in his heyday or in a resurgence of his popularity, Mr. Lovecraft is certainly no literary slouch, and his name can spring equal amounts of wide-eyed awe and horrific shudders, so much so that some people have gone beyond writing things inspired by Lovecraft, but writing things about him. One particular example of this is the graphic novel Neonomicon by comic book writer Alan Moore. In it, one character is meant to be something of a deconstruction of the late writer, as well as it being showed that his bibliography was actually a doomsday letter for the future. While the book itself is fairly divisive, to say the least, in essence, it's a decent example of taking an existing property and turning things on its head. Another more well-written story, called Fall of Cthulhu by Michael Allen Nelson, is the best example out there of taking an existing mythos and, and adding to it while not taking away from the grander themes or characters that exist within such a universe. If you appreciate the style and don't mind changing artistic visions, this is a great book and the omnibus cost me $30 on Amazon. But as much as I would love to discuss the finer intricacies and plot devices of those stories, today I am not so fortunate, because we must discuss the film Howard Lovecraft and the Frozen Kingdom, a direct-to-DVD release that claims to be a wonderfully told story with beautiful animation that is based off the graphic novel of the same name. While I have never read the book and therefore won't be discussing it, I can say that this movie is neither wonderfully told nor beautifully animated. It is a pitiful excuse for a children's movie, and I imagine adaptation, provided the story isn't just as terrible in the book as it is here. That should be avoided by all costs like reading from the dreaded Necronomicon or entering the Nightmare City of Relay. Basically, this movie is terrible and I find myself as your only line of defense if you saw the cover of the movie and felt a sense of dark curiosity like I did. The movie has what we'll call a rocky start to what will be a prelude to a series of boulders falling down a mountain, Raiders of the Lost Ark style. After opening up with a quote from the real-life Lovecraft that serves as a fairly prescient statement for those who decided to put this movie on, seconds later we're proven that our fear of the unknown is warranted as, as the animations and models seen are barely on par with the Veggie Tales, circa 1995. So bad, in fact, that you'll be able to see where the lip sync gives up and you'll find yourself wondering if Howard has a neck brace to keep his head supported. However terrible the animation is, though, one would be forgiving for assuming that there may actually be a decently told story once they found themselves staring down the barrel of the insane asylum housing Howard Lovecraft's father, who has found himself suffering from a bout of utter madness and speaking of things like the Necronomicon and terrible words. Abdul, he is coming. Father, please speak to me. He's coming. He's... Howard. Father. Howard, son. Listen. Listen to me. I made a mistake. No, I discovered it. A mistake. A glorious mistake. Father, I, I miss you. I miss you so much. Listen to me, son. Listen, but not to King Abdul, and not to the words. Don't ever listen to the words or symbols. The symbols will speak to you, but do not listen. Listen to me. This is in line with much of Lovecraft. A common theme amongst all of Lovecraft's stories is the concept that there are things 
that are not fit for the human faculties to process. Things ranging from something as simple as the words that Howard's father speaks of to the existence of the blind idiot god Azatoth are enough to induce instant madness, catatonia, and even death, typically via suicide. The Necronomicon is a famous piece of Lovecraftian lore that has such properties. Sometimes it's benign, but other times it opens up a portal to an alternate dimension or to the nightmare city of Relay. Like what happens in this movie? This scene right here, terrible animation and voice acting aside, is an indicator as well as a false promise of a good story. After a minor complaint to his mother, of being unable to sleep and wanting to be read a story, Howard's mother carelessly hands him a tomb of eldritch lore that Howard's father wrote himself, which makes me call into question several things. One has to assume that Howard's father had been going mad for quite a while and that this is not his usual behavior. True, this takes place just around the turn of the 20th century, when rules and knowledge about the mentally ill were still much behind the curve, but I only bring this up because, as the psychologist acknowledges, Winfield's psychotic ravings, it can be assumed that said psychologist would want to keep the tomb in question and any subsequent writings for research to gain deeper meaning and understanding to such a particular case of psychosis. So why, oh why, does the mother have such easy access to this book, and why she think it's a good idea to hand such a book to her small child. I have a few theories. The first is that she genuinely didn't know what the book was, but that seems too innocent. The second is that she knows that the book is related to her husband's research and writings and thinks it's nothing. But I go with the third option and believe that she knows exactly what it is and is so weary with the whole situation that she doesn't care what he's reading as long as he's either happy, out of her hair, or both, regardless of whether it might even be safe for him to see such a thing that could very well scar him for life. After reading through it, he finds that a portal is open to take him down down into the ether and into the Frozen Kingdom. Or it's supposed to be the Frozen Kingdom. Here it just looks like a level from Super Mario 64 with just barely, slightly higher resolution. In either case, Howard runs into a monster and finds himself feeling so unlucky that, like me, he feels like he's had the number 13 stamped into his face. Hi, I'm Den the Metaphor Man. I'm here to, uh, we'll say troubleshoot some of the movie man's more on point metaphors. Now, you might be wondering, what does the number 13 have to do with Howard Lovecraft and Frozen Kingdom? Right. The answer, so, not much. But to give a more in depth explanation as to what Dan is talking about, we must first discuss a man known as John Moses Browning. Now, for those of you who are not gun literate, John Moses Browning was the man who brought us the Model 19 handgun that we all know and love today that's been in service for literally over 100 years. Well, what most people don't know is that back in around the 20s, John Moses Browning came up with this design not long after for, let's see, here we go, for the French military. Is there a way to pop that up? The Browning High Power. Now, the French wanted the handgun that was easy to dis and reassemble, could hold at least 10 rounds, and let's see, what else is there? They needed a magazine disconnect, so. Nothing floated into it. This hammer is not going to go down no matter what I do. Which is a bit of an annoyance, but still, it's a tried and true model. When, I believe actually that John Browning died in 26, yeah, 1926, so he never actually saw the completion of it. It was his partner, Savier, I believe a Frenchman, who brought this to us today. And as the fate would have it, when this is loaded in 9mm, as it were, it comes in, I believe, three calibers. 9mm, 40 cal Smith & Wesson, and 7.62 by 25, some weird Russian round. But, when it is loaded in 9mm, it actually holds 13 rounds. My terrible aim aside, what Dan is getting at is that watching this movie feels like getting shot 13 times in the face with this thing right here. And so, with that, I think I've stolen enough of the screen time, and we'll get back to the proper review. After waking up in this frozen wasteland of polygons, Howard is greeted by Cthulhu, who we need to talk about now. Cthulhu is, at this point, one of the most well-known creations of H.P. Lovecraft's bibliography, as well as probably one of the most well-known horror icons on the planet. And for good reason. His whole concept is dripping with terror on all the most important levels of horror. His concept is that he's an interdimensional beast so powerful as to be considered a god, lying at the bottom of the South Pacific Ocean and waiting for the day to awake where it will bring madness to all. Cthulhu is essentially an invincible 
enemy that doesn't even hate us lesser beings. He just exists. And that alone is enough to drive us into a never-ending madness or even drive us to suicide. Cthulhu in Lovecraftian lore is a source of constant anxiety for humanity at the subconscious level. At any moment, Cthulhu could rise from the depths to morph the world in its image, and we would be powerless to stop it, and no one could help us. This movie makes Cthulhu out to be an all-powerful idiot who doesn't understand that he can't die and needs help from a small child who is quite literally rail thin. Save life, you master. Me, Tutu Mong. Susu, Tutu Among. Susu, Sudu? Tu, Tu Among. I literally have no idea what you're saying. You're a bit deaf, aren't you? After demonstrating that Howard is partially deaf in both ears, he decides to take it this new companion of his and name him Spot. And the two begin a trek throughout the frozen wasteland of leftover Norm of the North animation. Also, this is a villain that's too obvious with all the gloom and doom, and their minion appears to have some kind of throat cancer. Oh, no one wants to be my demon out of a thousand skies. <laughs> I have news. Someone please kill him. His life is pain. After the movie decides that the minion doesn't need to see an oncologist, we find out that this frozen kingdom is actually Relay. Where are we exactly? Relay. What? Where are we exactly? Relay. What? Where are we exactly? Relay. <laughs> <laughs> no! Hi, me again. This time I have this. A beautiful Smith & Wesson Model 19 revolver. Chambered in 357 mag. As a small treat to all of you at home, I thought I would show- Someone's having fun with that 22. Because I'm not someone who's fired very many magnum loads, mostly because I'm a little afraid, if I'm being honest. I'm a skinnier guy, it's a lot more for me to handle. But I want to show you this because I've actually, since I've had this for a few years, I've been firing it in 38 Special. Now you might be wondering, Dan, how are you going to fire two different rounds out of the same gun? That sounds very unsafe. And you are correct. For most guns. See, this is a 38 target load. Now what most people don't know is that 357 came in the 1930s, and the 38 caliber special was actually the parent cartridge. Let's see if you can see that nicely. And this is the 357 off to the left here. It's just a little bit longer. So there's more pressure, there's more powder, there's more power, but they are still the same diameter. You might not be able to tell because the rounds might throw it off, but they are in fact the same size, just different lengths. So. You can, in fact, for the most part, if a gun can only take 38 special, then it can only take 38 special. But a gun that's 357 can, in fact, take 357. So, for all of you today, I thought I would showcase a little bit of power on the 357 and just show you my initial reaction to shooting. I will try to put on a brave face because, quite frankly, this is really terrifying. All right, and as another another note about this pistol, this revolver in particular, is that it is both double and single action. So you could fire it, trigger pull, round, trigger pull, or you can do what I'm going to do and cock the hammer back. Now, take aim with something a little far out for starters. Could have swore I hit that, but that was terrifying anyway. There we go. I can't emphasize how different it feels with the 30 special as opposed to this. It feels fun, but at the same time, it's just wow. Oh, I twitched. I did. I pulled the trigger too soon on that one. Technically, I haven't used my. And I flinched. It's. I'm trying to anticipate recoil. I really shouldn't be doing that. The last one. Okay. Now you might be thinking to yourself, Dan, you're really terrible with these handguns. Well, handguns are a lot. <laughs> Nick just shook his head. Yes, handguns are a lot more difficult to fire properly. It takes a lot more practice. I'm much. More, I'm very more used to. Yeah, some of our other implements of death that we have on hand. But I want to illustrate a point in the high power a little bit. What you just witnessed here was a very cautious way of handling this. Because this is a lot more power than I'm used to, so obviously I need to take more care. And as we saw, 
I only got one shot anyway, and even then I kind of had a few moments where I was anticipating recoil, or I was just jerking the gun around in general. Well, that's a novice shooter. I'm not an expert. I would, wouldn't even say I'm an amateur. I'm still kind of learning. But that's probably a natural thing to have for a gun, because this right here is something that can easily hurt someone or kill them. What the movie man wants to illustrate is that he shouldn't be having this feeling for a kid's film. It's one thing if you have a sense of fear because you're shooting a gun. It's another if you're watching a bad movie. If the movie's so bad that it makes you feel like you could be, you could be killed by it at any moment, there's something wrong there. But with that, back to the review. What Dan said. Dear Drew, I decided to watch Howard Lovecraft and the Frozen Kingdom. Oh god, okay. So I'm probably coming to this right now. Here are some people to contact to wake me up. Please help me. Thank you. Okay. Minding freedom. Let's see what we can do. Hier spricht Minding Freedom, wie kann ich Ihnen helfen? Uh, hello. Who's this? I'm Drew, I'm a, I'm a friend of Dan. Who? You may know him as Dr. Manhattan. Oh God, what does he want? Well, uh, Dan's watched a bad movie and now he's in a coma, so I need some help waking him up. Wake him up? If he's in a coma, I should give this movie an Oscar. Listen, okay, we like Dan. I mean, it may not seem like it, but we like Dan, we need him. So can you give me something? Ugh, fine. Okay, so how are we going to do this exactly? Well, he's pretty passionate about a lot of things, so I think if we start telling him things that make him mad, he'll snap at it. Anything? No swearing! The audience is watching. Why no- You know what? I don't care. Hey Dan, I heard Uwe Boll is making a movie about Fallout! You're an autistic ice block and you should be ashamed. I talked to Xander. He said Karen Travis is gonna screenwrite for Halo 6. You're a low-down, dirty, Californian. Ooh, and I heard Tarantino's getting an Oscar for Best Writer. Deine Mutter! Okay. Yeah, this isn't working. Is there anything that we can say that can get fast results? Warning, may cause madness. <laughs> Do it again! Ooh, okay, okay. So, for Hawed, things are about to get really crazy. No, ah! no, 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 no! No, movie! Bad! It, it, uh, how dare you? How dare you, movie? How dare you do something like this? It's bad enough that this movie is like an abortion laid on the grave of H.P. Lovecraft himself, but the, this movie, it, 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 it doesn't even try. It doesn't even freaking try. All right? It goes on to say Relay was some kind of beautiful paradise when it was never like that in any piece of Lovecraftian lore. Relay is a nightmare dimension where going there just tears apart your existence to the base atoms and nothingness. It eviscerates your soul, your mind, your body, everything. It's the intersections of dimensions. It's home to things that defy nature. It's the place where Cthulhu sleeps until he's ready to take on the entirety of Earth! It was never Paradise Freaking Island, or Themyscira as it's more well known in Wonder Woman lore, nor was it a low-grade polygon-looking level from the days of the Atari Freaking Jaguar! HOW DARE YOU! Hmm... Um... Listen, it looks like you've got bigger problems than what I can deal with, so I'm gonna go. If you need me, I'll be staking out JJ Watt's house. Ah, uh, seriously, this movie is so lazy. It takes a concept that's kind of actually pretty interesting. I'm not opposed to what this movie wants to be on paper. But the problem is that the writers and whatnot of it decided to destroy the good hopes of a decent movie as if it was a bunker buster missile taking on a tank. Tank beats In the writing room, I can actually think of a whole bunch of different ideas that would be really good concepts for a movie. But the problem is this movie disregards all of them. The idea of examining Lovecraft himself and not just his works is something that's very prominent here and there. And the idea of taking it to that of him as a child and exploring how he got his ideas as a writer or some of the adventures he could have undertaken is 
honestly gold laid before you. I wanted to defend this movie. I saw it in the budget bin at Walmart last year and thought to myself, okay, it's clearly direct to DVD schlock that's probably not good, but even in the smallest recesses of bad movies, you can find something to defend about it. I legitimately believe that there's actual direct to DVD gems that go missing amongst all the sea of crap just because it's in a horrible area. Sure, they're generally cheaper and not as good, but sometimes you find the one that actually manages to do something right and it's very enjoyable. Sometimes it's just so bad it's good, sometimes it's just legitimately good. The movie Badass, starring Danny Trejo, is an example of a direct-to-DVD movie that's pretty enjoyable when you get down to it. It's just about an old Vietnam vet who goes viral and suddenly it's like, hey, Danny Trejo is a vigilante. Who doesn't love that idea? So for me and my money, I legitimately tend to go a little bit easier on some of the direct-to-DVD movies I see in just like a Dollar Tree or a Walmart or something. Because for all I know, that's the next Citizen Kane as far as I'm concerned. I admit, I cringed when I saw it. I cringed hard. I meant to make a joke on Twitter in which I went to the bleach aisle to grab something to drink fast, but still, that doesn't negate that there's usually something to defend in some directed DVD movies. Like, this was my exact reaction to seeing this movie on the rack, point blank, no, no holding back on the alarm bells ringing in my head. This was my re reaction directly after when I tried to apply that little philosophy of give it a chance. Well, when life gives you lemons. And this is my reaction to literally every conceivable nanosecond this movie inflicted upon me when I put it into my Xbox to watch it last year. No! No! Also, this might just be me, but a lot of these dream sequences in this movie, where it has all this weird kind of fluorescent looking green and purple, where it's otherworldly and stuff, it always reminds me of this. I'd rather be shiny like a treasure from a sunken pirate wreck. Scrub the deck and make it look shiny. I will sparkle like a wealthy woman's neck. Like, I, I can't turn it off. I just can't stop thinking of the dude from Flight of the Concords being in Moana as a giant sea crab. I just, I can't, I just can't negate the, the, the thought. But okay, okay. <sighs> All right, maybe this movie isn't that bad. Maybe I'm just being overly hyperbolic and I'm just overreacting because I wasted time voluntarily to review this movie and now we're here. Well, and that's always true. I mean, it's not like they do something just totally cliched and oh my God, they do, don't they? man again. This time I have a shotgun. A wonderful Remington 870 by the, from the cameraman Nick. Now, no need to delay the inevitable. Let's shoot this son of a gun. Let's shoot this son of a gun, as it were. Wow. Oh, five. <laughs> oh. I'll tell you what, we got some other stuff here for you. Tube. Safety on, so we're sure no one's gonna die. I don't need that on my conscience tonight. Load some of this, I believe it was Olin Corporation, something like that. It's the same buckshot the military uses as, as an effect. That's a cap, not a, not a shot. I think we're good. All right, let's see what the boys out there are using. I guess we can't shoot anymore. But wait. In my back pocket, we have these right here. One ounce slugs, which you can kill a deer with. Since I'm just shooting at the corpses of bottles, this is extremely wasteful. But when in Rome, waste some ammo. That's not quite the phrase, obviously, but I have to embellish a little bit. 
if I can get them all in my pocket. Oh, there's one more down in there. Pulling buckshot on my butt, or slugs on my butt. This is not how my night was supposed to go. All right. The range, as it were, is extremely hot. Let's see if I can hit that bottle out there. Oh, that's weird. Huh. She jammed. Let's see if I can get that figured out. What have you done? Huh. Yeah, let's go ahead and just stop and figure this out. All right, so we found out that apparently this gun right here, beautiful as it is, is still new. And so I kind of made a mistake for putting a slug through it. So we're just gonna go ahead and let Nick show it off. I'll hit you real quick. <laughs> still not happy. Still not happy? I, s I hope to God I did not break this thing. Doesn't like having five anymore. <laughs> oh boy. Well, it's hot. Oh dear. Oh, thank God. <laughs> it wasn't. There we go. She empty? It's good. All right. You want to trade? Yeah. yeah. Well, if it weren't for the fact that <laughs> this gun is new, and you really, you shouldn't just put one of these through it like it's a target load, because it's heavier, it's a little bit more for the gun to handle, and clearly we just caused some kind of break-in period thing that I didn't even know was possible. Oh, hey. Super mag receiver, apparently. Hmm. But anyway. $650 gun. What's that? $650 gun. Is it $150? $600. Oh my god, that's, I was gonna say that's way cheap for this thing, but anyway, you may be wondering what this part of the video is all about. Not much. See, what's happening now is that the writing part of Dan is kind of, well, to put it lightly, he's a bit hard up for something to talk about in this part of the film, and he just wanted to provide some kind of good, wholesome entertainment for all you at home. But I imagine that if you took the spread of a few of these buckshot rounds and overlaid them with a couple of different kinds of each other, then you, and then you overlaid Movie Man's face, you would probably have a pretty accurate depiction as to what happened to his sanity after watching this movie. So I think that that's all I can say for now. I'll see you guys when I see you. After some time, Algid Bunk, the apparent queen of Relay, tells Howard of a man named Abdul al -Zared. In Lovecraft lore, Abdul is known as the Mad Arab and is credited for penning the dreaded Necronomicon. If for any reason the Necronomicon is brought up in a Lovecraftian setting, then there is a 9 to 1 chance that Abdul will turn up just because of the fact that he is the author of Madness. It should be supremely obvious by this point that Algid is the villain, and spoiler for you all, but Algid is also Abdul al -Zaret. But let's just talk about something else about this movie. You may notice that the DVD cover claims to have the voice talent of people like Christopher Plummer, Jane Curtin, and Ron Perlman, actors with extremely extensive and dare I say prolific acting careers. These are not names that anyone from the target demographic would know readily, and these are actors who barely have any screen time in comparison to the likes of the voice actors or how or spot. Yet their names are proudly plastered on the movie cover, as if to say, yes, these people who very may well be your favorite actors are in fact in this movie. So here are my hypotheses. The first is that the director and publicity agent were so desperate to make sure that this movie got attention, knowing full well that the movie was trash, did this as a last ditch effort. The second is that it was also that the people at Arcana Studios planned for this movie to be a family movie that parents could get behind to maximize their profit. In fact, when you time all their parts, I'm sure they're barely in the movie for two minutes 
at least or 10 minutes at most. So here's my final thought. Either the film crew knew what they made was terrible and they wanted the viewer to have a portal to better movies very similar to the portal earlier in this film or they wanted to have some way to gouge you dear viewer for extra cash based on your dear sweet grandmoms and her enjoyment of third rock from the sun. Both of these are possibilities in my mind. But let us finally come to the conclusion of this film in which the kids from before come back to help Howard fight against oh my god. <sighs> okay, so this is the precise moment in the movie that clenches everything that's really terrible about it. Now, it's not uncommon in a lot of Lovecraftian works to get to the point where the world comes this close to ending and all of humanity is destroyed and the main characters just barely save the world, usually by some kind of inadvertent consequence that they didn't even think of or the main big bad just got bored and didn't want to do it anyway. I want to emphasize, the people in these works have no idea what they're doing. It is literally just blind luck that they actually managed to avert the inevitable catastrophe of human extinction by way of Elder Gods. So when it comes down to Spot here turning into Cthulhu as he was always meant to, becoming ravenous, the Mad Priest vying for control of the entire dimension of Relay, and it's thwarted by literally a bunch of kids taking down the elite guards of Abdul Al-Zared, as if they're in some kind of Saturday morning cartoon, and how we're preventing the apocalypse with the power of love. <sighs> All right, listen. I'm not a nihilist. I'm, I'm not someone who subscribes to the idea of nihilism by any stretch of the imagination. I'm firmly anti that. I genuinely believe that everything has some kind of purpose and we're here for more than just eat, sleep, procreate, and perpetuate the bloodlines that we have. I, I, I stand against that idea and I'm very much against the concept that whatever we do doesn't matter whether it's a short trip into the year or like eons down the road. Because I think everything does kind of circle back and has some kind of cause and effect. Like, I don't like to think that these are just chemical reactors that are always dying and just want to preserve themselves because that kind of takes away the magic of the universe and the mystery of it all. If for some reason this is all pointless, which I highly doubt, then what is the majesty and the beauty of the universe in and of itself? The fact that whether you believe something created all this or it's just random happenstance, I don't like the idea of just nothing having meaning because it robs the beauty of this existing. The fact that we can make things like art, music, machinery, anything. The fact that we can progress in such a, a weirdly inhospitable world. There's a saying I kind of remember sometimes that Drew once brought to my attention that technology fails despite the best conditions, but life prevails despite imperfect ones. And I like that saying. I think it's a very interesting idea and it's cool to really acknowledge that and be like, wow, this right here, this, this is a work of art that we are bestowed. So when there's people who say that the universe doesn't matter, I just generally tell them, yeah, well, I'm sorry you feel that way. This is a, we are living in a Monet painting or something. But here's the thing. I'm not so against it that I can't entertain it for a certain setting. True, I'd sooner enact coitus with a garbage disposal than believe it for myself. But if you take it in a setting like a Lovecraftian story, then hey, now you got something kind of terrifying there. One of the things that makes H.P. Lovecraft's work so terrifying and horrific to the senses is just the general meaninglessness of humanity. Like literally, everything that the Elder Gods do is not to the benefit or the detriment of human society. They literally don't care. They see us as we see ants. Or even less, they probably see us as we see amoebas. And the fact that any time we are spared, it's just blind luck, or we are so meaningless to the universe as to be part of some great cosmic game that we didn't ask to be a part of, that's terrifying. That is legitimately horrific to think about. And it works so well in H.P. Lovecraft's work. Like, let me show you a piece of existential horror that stuck with me ever since I saw it. In episode 305, Rick and Morty, Rick actually takes Jerry to an alien resort where the richest people who stay there are all encapsulated in this immortality field. There's literally nothing that can happen to you there that you won't immediately bounce back from and you will never stay dead permanently until you leave that field. To demonstrate this field, we actually see not even morbidly obese. He's a planetoid and he keeps eating despite the fact that he should be having about 17 different heart attacks. And then we see two children running around shooting each other with actual guns and killing each other. And they just keep getting back up. 
<laughs> okay, but still, bad parenting. But after a failed assassination attempt on Rick's life, that actually leaves this immortality field destroyed and everybody vulnerable to death again, we are then treated to, to the following clip. What this clip does is probably the most apathy-inducing and depressing thing that has ever been put to television. <laughs> Made that? that right there was one of the many stepping stones that Rick and Morty takes to one of the logical conclusions of nihilism and cosmic horror. Not only is it one universe that is completely indifferent to any and all life within it, but it is the entire multiverse that literally does not care if you live or die. You are one of an infinite number of disposable people. The literal death of infinite children does not matter. It is, in effect, entirely inconsequential to the rest of existence. And this is the terror that fills the pages of H.P. Lovecraft. And that is precisely why this movie is so enraging to me. I'm not saying that these kids in this movie deserve to get axed off like it just didn't even matter. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that you can tell a dark story to a child and it actually be good and not insulting to their intelligence. I know it for a fact. I've seen it in action numerous times. And that's probably one of the most damning things about this entire film, if you can call it that. It doesn't challenge the mind. Not just my mind, but a small kid's mind. One of the most horrific things I can think of in animation that I remember seeing as a child that still kind of terrifies me as an adult is the scene in Prince of Egypt in which the angel of death comes down and takes the firstborn child of every house that doesn't have lamb's blood on the doorframe. But despite the fact that it scares the living bejesus out of me, it is still mystifying and beautiful to me. And Howard Lovecraft could have been something like that. This could have been like a dark story in which Howard Lovecraft sees the prophesized end of the world and he decides to go back to the human world to write down his experiences, write down what he's seen, what he knows is going to happen in a vain attempt to find a way to warn us. And we just don't listen. You see that? I wrote that sentence when I was distracted, hungry, and tired while watching YouTube videos. I should not be doing a better job than a director who was paid for this. In short, this movie has driven me to my own personal form of madness. And I plan to exact revenge upon it. Hello there. No metaphor man for this one. This is all the movie man on this part. Now, I would like to do a small dedication right now for this part of the video. Because see, this rifle right here, this Ruger M77 that's chambered in 270 Winchester, this is actually my first, well not my first rifle, this is probably my second rifle that my grandfather gave me, I want to say sometime in high school. And some of you might notice I actually wear a shell casing quite a bit, well I wear this because I want to say it was when I was 16 that I used this rifle right here to kill my first elk. And my grandpa was there, and he's someone who's very special to me. And I admit, I probably go and see him more. And I'm a little ashamed that I don't see him more often. But I want him to know that I appreciate him and I love him dearly. And if it weren't for him, I wouldn't have the gun knowledge I do now or the enjoyment that I do now. And I want to demonstrate that by using this beauty right here. So, this rifle is pretty accurate. It fires a fairly decent sized shell. But, for the sake of making sure that we're on target, we're gonna go ahead and we're just gonna sight it in a little bit before we get to killing this movie. All right, I think I see a bottle out there that's trying to infringe on my freedoms. If we can't read it, I took a picture of it, so we'll see how that goes pretty out there. I might need to get a little lower. Use this 12 gauge box as a stand. Do some stuff out of the way a little bit. All right. Well, I missed that one. That's okay, we got more ammo. In fact, I'm just gonna load this one up a bit more to make sure we get her. All right, three rounds in a 270. Little high. 
high. Still too high. And maybe I'm not aiming high enough. No, I think I'm aiming a little high. There we go. <laughs> Two of the third time, fourth time's a charm, I guess. All right. Now, I think it's safe to say that we've dissect we've dissected this movie enough for one day. So we're gonna go ahead and kill it and send it back from what's it can. All right. Tell me when it's dead. I can see it from here. <sighs> it's dead. Yes! <laughs> Dan, you got it. Ryan, his stupid little cheek. <laughs> oh god, that's so great. Yep. Sweet. Ladies and gentlemen, I give to you a dead movie. How how bad would you be if it got right in the center of the DVD? I I'd actually be both impressed and mad. <laughs> You're like, I'm a good shot, but dang it. gonna run a little buckshot through this bad boy. That's not uh, much different from a target load, weirdly enough. <laughs> Look at that. Ooh. Slug. Yep. <laughs> it hurts, but in a good way. We have a list of people that we would take a bullet for them, a bullet for you, a bullet for everybody in this room, but they don't seem to see many bullets coming through. See many bullets coming through metaphorically, I'm the man, but literally I don't know what I do. I'd live for you and that's hard to do, even harder to say when you know it's not true, even harder to write when you know that tonight there were people back home who tried talking to you, but then you ignored them still. All these questions, they're for me, like who would you live for, who would you die for, and would you ever kill? Oh, 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 I'm born, so I'm taking my time on my ride. Well, I had my release on this issue. I hope you all had a good time watching this video, and I hope that you subscribe if you're new to the channel. With that, I'm Danny Booby Man. Have a happy Halloween. I've been thinking too much.